Hello, everyone, and welcome to class. Oh, some gorgeous blue waters behind us. Well, after today's class, I will have to say farewell to you. I'm setting off. But don't worry, I'll be back next week. Same time, same place, same channel. T today's journey, I don't know where it's going to take me. And I got to admit, I don't know how to swim. So, you know, if I, fall, if I fall off the boat, that's it. But I'm not worried. I'm rather confident. And you might ask why? What is the source of my great confidence? Well, it's the goddess. This is the goddess Matsu, a very popular goddess in East Asia and in the Chinese religious world. She is a goddess of the sea who protects sailors and protects those who were going off and voyaging off into the waters. Well, before I go off on my journey, perhaps we'll give you a little brief lecture on Chinese folk religion. Let's take a look. Okay, so Folk religion or popular religion, it's a term used by, to describe something that we find across different cultures and traditions. These are forms of what we, what we might call religious practice or religious belief or religious traditions that don't belong to any one set canon of scriptures or one organized tradition but rather could represent, inform, and be informed by a variety of religions. So this is the religion of the common folk, the folk religion, the religion of the populace, the popular religion. So this, these two things, the terms mean the same thing, at least for the purposes of this class. All right, so what is popular or folk religion? It is the syncretic and nameless religion so the, the, these are like a basket of different beliefs and practices and traditions, often featuring beliefs about ghosts, gods, spirit mediums, or shamans, the practice of magic, divination, and festivals. These are things that don't belong to any one category of religion but are often intersect with other religions that are like Buddhism or Hinduism or the, for example, in Christianity, the folk religious traditions of Europe informed the development of Christianity in Europe. Often these are local customs and instead of finding them in a scripture, they're passed down orally. And in Chinese religion, we're gonna be looking at three main classes of divine beings. The Shen, these are the gods and goddesses. The ghosts, there's many names for ghosts, but the common term is Gui. And then we have ancestors, the Ju. The practices of popular and folk religion include rituals, offerings, and sacrifices. And these are festivals and ceremonies intended to bring luck please gods and ancestors, and then drive away evil spirits. Okay, let's take a look. So syncretism. When we talk about the religions of China, we had mentioned earlier how they're often those in China won't identify with just one religion, but rather will incorporate either directly or indirectly elements from different religions, such as this is Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and the local oral and folk traditions of popular or folk religion. Many of the elements of practice and tradition and culture we've seen develop out of the ancient Yellow River Valley civilization. And we've seen these themes of balance and union a balance between heaven and earth, a union of the, those within society, of family members. Well, there is this interconnectedness viewed in Chinese religious thoughts of everything. Everything interconnects through the power of energy, the power of qi, 
chi will bring different things that are seemingly opposite and contradictory together as yin and yang. This is how gods, humans, animals, spirits, ancestors are all united as one. We'll begin with the ancestors. So the ancestors, so family and family ties are foundational to cultural and religious identity all throughout the world, including in China. Ancestors can aid their descendants from heaven if they're cared for. So the great, our great ancestors of the past, it's believed in Chinese religious thoughts that they can intercede, they can ask the spirits and the gods of the heavens to help their family members so long as the ancestors are remembered and cared for. If not cared for, the spirits can become dangerous ghosts threatening the family. So the ancestors, so long as they're not forgotten, so long as they're honored and cared for, are still connected to the family. But if there's disunion, well, these ancestors can turn dangerous. And so we burn money. I said, have any of you ever burned money before? Well, let's burn some money. This is the Qingming Festival, the tradition of, tradition of burning money. This is, this is not regular money like we have down here. This is special paper money called Josh money. And it is money that can go to the ancestors as the fire transmit that which is on, which is on earth to heaven. All right, and this is, we're gonna look at one Chinese religious festival. And this is the Qingming festival. Let's take a, a closer look here. And you'll be watching a variety of festivals this week in this week's module. All right, and we're gonna see one individual's account of the Qingming festival. Sorry, we're having a little bit of troubles, but we will harmonize with the Tao again. And yes, here we are, we're back to the Qingming Festival. My great-grandfather was a wealthy merchant and he had five wives and my family came from the third wife. When they died sometime between the 1930s and 1940s, they were buried in the grounds of Bukit Brown. I only found out that my great-grandparents were buried in Bukit Brown a few years ago due to the announcement of the new construction of the highway that would go through the cemetery. The first time I ever visited my great-grandparents' grave was last year. The whole area is very untouched, a lot of mature trees, a lot of wildlife. It's pretty much like a very dense forest. So I can see why so many people came forward to protest against the construction of the highway. But on the other hand, a lot of the cemetery is also very poorly maintained. There were many graves that were seemingly forgotten. They were overgrown with weeds. Some of them were just looking really worn out. Graves that are higher up would cost more than graves that are on lower ground. The further up you go, the more elaborate the graves become. So even in the afterlife, I think they believe in this hierarchy. My great-grandfather, he's buried on a very steep hill. When my grandmother was still alive, she would actually climb the hills of Bukit Brown in her sarong kabaya to pay her respects to her parents every year during the Qingming festival. When she was no longer able to do this, my aunties and uncles carried on the tradition and they've been doing this for the past 50 years. Wait, wait. Something shan got bombed off. Something long. His tombstone has the names of his five wives and all of his children. 
but part of the tombstone has been damaged and my uncle thinks that it was damaged during the Japanese occupation. So there are three parts to the ceremony and the first part is the grave sweeping aspect. So this is where we would clean the tombstone and remove any weeds. And then the second aspect would be the prayer aspect. So my uncle would light up joysticks and we would stick the joysticks in the ground. And then members of the family would come around and take turns to offer their prayers to our ancestors. When you're done with the first two parts, then you would give your offerings to your ancestors. This can be in the form of food or paper money or paper houses. My great-grandmother was a Peranakan lady, um, so this year my auntie brought some paper sarong kabayas to burn as a form of offering. So the idea is that these goods would be received by the ancestors in the afterlife. These days I know that some shops they make paper iPads and paper Mercedes Benzes for people to burn as offerings. So at the end of the entire ceremony, the family members would gather around the tomb and we would throw up these coloured paper in the air, shouting to the heavens for blessings. In the modern day Qingming ceremony, I get a sense that there is so much emphasis on material offerings and also the expectation to be blessed with wealth and luck in return. And I think that's very far away from the original meaning of the Qingming festival. I think my family still keeps up with the tradition because my grandmother did it quite religiously while she was still able to do so. The cousins in my generation find the whole ceremony quite amusing. It's kind of like a little adventure that we embark on at 7am in the morning, once a year. This notion of paying respects to your ancestors is one of the fundamentals of Confucianism, which is what the Chinese society is built upon. But you actually tend to see less of the next generation joining in. And it's quite sad if you think about it, because the Qingming festival has a history that spans over 2,000 years. I think in the next few generations, my great-grandfather's grave would probably be forgotten, just like majority of the graves in Bukit Brown. Either that or it will be exhumed because of a major redevelopment project by the government. We'll see. All right, so just a few things about that that we just saw. Well, so this was the Qingming Festival, and we saw one individual's Account of this tradition and its importance and its significance. But also we can recall from the video, this individual mentioned how she's afraid that, that this tradition will be forgotten or maybe these tombs will, are going to go into decay and the traditions of connecting with the ancestors might be lost in the modern world. Maybe even highway development might take place over this land. Okay, so that's the Qingming Festival. During this time, there's a cleaning of the graves and an offering of incense and the offering of goods to the ancestors. And, and one of the things you might have recalled from the short video clip is that nowadays, even modern contemporary things like, like iPad, tablets, and phones and whatnot are being offered in the form of paper. The paper is theoretically, symbolically, it's burned, and then those objects will go to the ancestors in the heavens. On the other end of the spectrum, Chinese religious belief, folk tradition, Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, all the different traditions have created a vast array of ghostly beings. Let's meet a few of them. So those who have died untimely or violent deaths. And this is a theme in many traditions, those who have died before their times or have died in a way that the spirit cannot have rest. Maybe the spirit has been you know, murdered by an individual or, or has died with, but meaning to convey some message to someone before they passed on. There's multiple beliefs about ghosts. 
uncared for deceased relatives, so ancestors that are forgotten, can turn into troublesome spirits. Souls that for whatever reason will linger on earth. Now, what is the soul in Chinese religious thought? Well, there's a lot of different answers to that. And it depends on what perspective we're looking from. But a common idea is that, that the spirits of the departed can be connected with via mediums. This is a common idea in folk religion, people who can through seances and trances channel the gods or the spirits of the deceased. And Chinese religions and often posit, and this is common to the folk understanding that each individual has two souls which will separate at the time of death. There's a Hun soul and a Po soul. The Hun represents the Yang energy and goes to the ancestral heavenly lands. And the Po represents the Yin elements and it remains here on earth. All souls, these different types of souls and spirits are honored during an annual ghost festival called the Double Ninth Festival. Think of Halloween or different days of the dead across different religions. Well, the ghost festival. The ghost festival is the ninth month of the Chinese calendar. This is a lunar calendar. The gates of hell will open for ghosts to return to this world. Family members will offer food and they'll burn special banknotes called hell banknotes. These are, this is a form of currency that the spirits of the underworld can use to buy things or to bribe, if it, bribe beings who might be bothering them. Floating lamps are often, lotus, lo, floating lotus lamps are often lit and put on water as a way of guiding the souls back to the afterlife. All right, and then we have the gods of popular and folk religion. And here's the two main things about folk religion. There's a vast hierarchy of gods and goddesses. So there's different ranks. You can think of whether it's any, any um, there's different ranks of employment, there's different ranks in the army, there's different ranks in the government. There are different ranks to gods and goddesses in folk religion. The pantheon is described as a bureaucratic pantheon and that you have different branches of gods and goddesses with domains of power modeled after different branches of government. So you just like you have, maybe you could have a president that would be like the Jade Emperor. Then you have your, your state form of government. This would be a, a lesser god or maybe a governor. And then you'd have a mayor, and then your local councilman or councilwoman. So the Jade Emperor is the higher, is the height of this, is the highest official in this hierarchy. All other beings ultimately fall under the Jade Emperor. At the lower end, you have local village gods. This is the Tudi Gong. So think if different colleges or different universities, each one had their like spirit to represent them. This would be the equivalent of a, of a Tudi Gong. These are village gods or goddesses watching over a very specific domain. These are among the lowest rank of the different spirits. You also will have household gods and goddesses. These are gods of the stove or the kitchen gods called Zhao Shen. The Shao Shen is unique to each family. And often you'll have a picture of whatever the, the kitchen or house god is placed near the stove. This, this spirit will protect the home and monitor the deeds of the family. And each year, the stove god or the kitchen god who's been watching all the family members will report back to this heavenly bureaucracy, what each, how each individual family has been doing morally, what are their good deeds and bad deeds, whether they deserve blessings and, or punishments. Very common also are door gods. These are placed at gateways to ward off 
evil, evil spirits and entities. At the higher end, you have the city gods. And I think this is from the Chinese city of Shanghai. So we can, this is like a great mayoral god. This is a very important deity, not as high as the Jade Emperor, but higher than say that the Chudigong or the stove god. Some popular deities, this include Guandi and Matsu. Guandi has his origins in a famous general, Guan Yu, who upon his death, because of his, no, of, of his honor as his, and, his, and his martial skills, but also his compassion was elevated to the ranks of a war god very popular in Chinese religions. And we talked about Matsu earlier. This is the goddess who watches over the sea and watch and guides those who are, are embarking on journeys by boat from one location to the next. All right, in this week's discussion board, you're gonna see a lot of the New Year Spring Festival. And this draws on these common themes of folk religion, where you're engaging in tradition to please the gods or ancestors so that you're gonna have great luck and great fortune in the new year, but you're also gonna ward away evil spirits. For example, for those of you who have been to fire, who've seen fireworks and you enjoy fireworks, in Chinese culture, it's been believed that fireworks would scare off evil spirits. And that's why fireworks are so important during the new year. Also, the lion dance was a dance meant to, has traditionally been seen as a dance meant to ward away evil. You'll also observe different customs meant to symbolize unity and harmony within the family. Okay, well, that ends our journey for today. Okay, so in the meantime, before I embark out onto the sea, just reminding you to stay safe, Stay well and stay tuned.